Good morning and welcome to the Great Tree Zen Women's Temple. Um, this morning we are in Sashim and our speaker will be the Reverend Tejo Munich. Would you please do the opening sutra for us, please? And surpass penetrating and perfect Dharma is rarely met with in a hundred thousand million papas, having it to see and listen to, remember and accept. I vow to taste the truth of the Sakakita's teaching. And now a brief message on Dana. In Buddhism, when Zen practitioners share their understanding of the teachings and practice, it is offered freely as a practice of Dana Paramita. Dana is a Pali word that means generosity or to give freely. And this practice is done without expectation of getting something in return. This is the spirit of speaking about the Dharma. Other ways to practice Dana is to offer support to those who share the teachings to support places of spiritual practice and to give without judgment or expectation when opportunities arise. Those who share the teachings at Great Tree do so on a Donna basis. Please support your practice by giving what you can. And to give to Great Tree, you need to go to greattreetemple.org and follow the donate path. Thank you. Our speaker this morning, like I said, is the Reverend Sylvia Muni. Founder and abbess of Great Trees in Women's Temple. And we will now hear from her. Thank you. Good morning. I'm always trying to. Uh... <clears throat> come up with titles for these talks because it helps me focus. So um, when I was trying to come up for, with a title for this talk, I thought, well, uh, Nehan is what we're celebrating. That's why we're doing the session. Can you put that on and take it off of the camera? No, take it off of my camera. Oh, okay. <clears throat> um, and Nehan is uh, is when uh, I, I don't know if this is just Soto Zen or if this is uh, Japan, Japanese Buddhism or whatever, but anyway, in Soto Zen uh, Nehan is, is a commemoration of uh, this celebration of Buddha's death and Nirvana So I thought, oh, I'll call it Nirvana. So that's how it got this title. <laughs> um, but then um, when I started thinking about it earlier um, this week, I thought, what was I thinking? I don't know what Nirvana is. <laughs> and, uh, but then I remember the, I, I do have a sense of what Nirvana is. You know? um, and of course, my first inclination was to Google it and see if anybody had an explanation that sort of aligned with what I was thinking. And I thought, no, there's too many things out there called nirvana. That's too confusing. So I didn't open up my Google. I just thought, well, um, I'll just um, try and explain what my understanding is. So that's where we are right now. Um, I uh, wonder, it was one of those words, Nirvana, that, you know, over, over the years, you kind of are kind of in the background of your practice. And I, I you know, it would come up and I would think, what is that? And, but then there's so many of those words and you just, and it's so hard to get anybody to describe them that um, you finally kind of give up and say, well, uh, eventually maybe I'll understand. And so I, I kind of put it on the back burner. But um, one day, I don't remember, maybe it was 10 years ago, I was 
transcribing some commentaries by my friend Shilako Amora. And he he used the word nirvana and then he said that means freedom. And he the context he used it in just to give you a sense of what he was talking about in terms of freedom is he said uh, there are four truths in Buddhism, four underlying truths. One, of course, is the truth of suffering of dukkha. Uh, and the second one is the truth of impermanence. And the third one is the truth of interdependence. And the fourth one is the truth of nirvana and the sound. And nirvana is freedom. And he said, <clears throat> if you don't awaken to impermanence and interdependence, we suffer. And if we do, we're free. And um, I thought, oh, I I know that kind of thing because in zazen we experience nirvana again and again. Um, it's those moments when we think nothing is happening. Maybe we think we were sleeping, but we know we weren't. Um, it's, those, it's those moments when we let go. And we say right effort. You know, the eightfold path means um, just getting yourself to the cushion because any, doing anything as stupid as sitting and facing the wall, you have to let go of something. And I, I think that um, my one of my first remembrances of uh, kind of wanting to escape at the Zen Center was I thought, why am I sitting here doing this? I have so much to do. Why am I sitting here doing nothing? And that's another moment when you stay, it's that step beyond um, resistance. It's that step beyond these excuses that we give ourselves for, oh, I don't have to practice today. I'm not deluded today. No delusion is coming up in my life today. And when we step beyond that and we'll say, well, even though I don't, I don't feel like I'm very deluded today, like things are going pretty smoothly. And I, even though I feel like I don't need to get to do zazen, it's anyway, it's time for zazen. So I do zazen and my delusion moves up in front of me. Oh, yes. That's a new delusion. Joako once said, my delusion keeps coming up. <laughs> and I was like, you got that right. But you know, it's comforting to, to hear someone else say that because even though you experience it, to, to recognize it, to recognize that, uh, oh yeah, this is part of life, this is part of human life, uh, helps us, I think, to recognize the value of uh, really committing ourselves to some kind of spiritual practice. And for me, that means sitting on a cushion and doing nothing. Um, but it's not really doing nothing. It's just noticing I'm thinking too much. And then I notice it. That is letting go. Noticing that I'm obsessing about something. I'm noticing that I'm angry about something. And then just taking a deep breath. Just that, just those moments uh, of letting go is the experience of letting go. Yes. And um, so I was talking about this uh, to my, a couple of friends that I had a meeting with yesterday. I said, you know, I don't really have too much to say about nirvana except that nirvana um, is freedom. And it's, it's a different, and then we were talking about how it's a different kind of freedom. It's not like the freedom that you try to get by um, escaping in, into something that um, helps you forget uh, this, the 
the things in life that we don't we don't like or that we don't want to feel. Um, it's not that kind of um, freedom because that's not real freedom. That's a kind of maybe a temporary uh, stepping aside or stepping out of something. Which sometimes that's what we got to do, but. To recognize that that's not true freedom, I think, is very valuable because then it, it begs a question well, what is true freedom? And we look a little further. And um, so, anyway, we were having this conversation, and these are the people that I, I was having this meeting with that are both um, students of Thich Nhat Hanh, and uh, one of them has practiced extensively with Thich Nhat Hanh, and she said, Well, Thich Nhat Hanh said, um, that when we when we when we come into this life, we're we're unirvanicized. And I was like, that is so true. So then we had a conversation about how we come into this life and, and how um how a child, how as children, we we are we are really true seekers as babies. You know, I always think about how babies, how we learned how to talk, how we learned how to walk. It was just, we knew, we got a sense that people were communicating or something. We wanted to be part of that. We wanted, to, we were looking for connection. I think this is um, what we're always doing in life, we're looking for connection. And I think the reason that we're always looking for connection is because we are interconnected and we know that. And so how do we, how do we, how can we find that experience of interconnection? And again, the truest, the purest and most um, helpful experience of interdependence, I think, happens when we let go in Zazen. And you know, when we when we commit to a session like that, Liz and we're sitting together. Um, and it, you know, if it's more than a couple of days, you might not notice it so much, but after um, three or four or five days, you start to notice that you are experiencing other people uh, and, and you're noticing that if they're drooping or if they're up their eyes up. And being inspired by other people just by the way they get up off the cushion. And um, that connection is not, you don't think about it. It's just, it's a response. It's just a very natural response. And that's what happens when we sit down and shut up. Um, and it's not what happens in most of our life, especially. These days, I, I knew I, I was talking to someone yesterday, I don't know who I was talking to, maybe it was one of you, about um, I'm going uh, back to a convent where I used to be when I was young, and I'm going back to the retreat. And uh, I was saying, I, it's in uh, South Dakota. <laughs> And right on the Missouri River, I'm looking at up in Plaza, Nebraska, and how there's something there that really appeals to me. And it's not, it's 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 the the women who are mostly from that area, which is very rural, and um, it's the farming community all around. It's it's something about the simplicity of it. Um, that's very appealing, and um, and I think that that kind of environment, uh, whether we realize it or not, is very conducive to uh, because we're in nature so much here too. Um, to experiencing that connection. And Dogen's and talks about it as um, that he said, when I experience this, and he said we experience it every time we sit down in meditation, 
is the experience of the art as an awakening or sometimes people call it enlightenment um, or nirvana. But that experience of um, letting go um, He says that when we have that experience, the trees and the walls and the grasses and the fences, everything starts to speak to, speak the Dharma. And you know, uh, we used to have some of these sashims at the Zen Center, <clears throat> and we had them four times a year, but one of them was in the end of December, it was a New Year's sashim. And uh, frequently, um, and we didn't live at the Zen Center. There wasn't a space except for the family to live there. So we all lived in the neighborhood. So we would, you know, walk back and forth and we'd walk out. And uh, first of all, there was a lake across the street, which would be frozen and covered with snow. And or the trees would be lined with snow. I looked out this morning and the trees were lined with snow. and. Uh, and, and something about Sashin that um, awakens, allows you to be awake to all of that beauty that a lot of times you take for granted. And I just remember walking out of the Zen Center sometimes, like in the middle of Sashin, and just being so struck by things that, you know, I, I grew up in Minnesota. I had seen those things all my life. But um, just to have that, that um, kind of, uh, Attentiveness. When I was thinking about this word nirvana, I was thinking about how um, it's it's awareness, it's a freedom that allows us to be really aware of our life in a bigger way than come on, okay, we wish you say our, our narrow telescope, you know, our um, a narrow way of, of thinking and just being in our minds. My teacher in Japan, um, when I first first met him, he didn't know what to do with me because he had he had been I had practiced for inside when he was young and and he and then he had left that monastery and found a social teacher and he was considered to be a social teacher. Um, so social and Rinzai are quite different. And so my teacher, Katiri Roshi, only practiced Shikantaza. He only talked about Shikantaza. He talked about Dogen just 24 7, and that was his, that was his whole practice was Shikantaza practice on Dogen Zenji. And so, um, but Arata Roshi, when I first got there, he said to me, well, um, what's your practice? I said, what do you mean, what's my practice? And he said, you know, I said, what's, what, what are my choices? What does that mean? So uh, there's Shikantaza, and there's um, Breath, breathing practice, and there's um, ring, I don't know, this koan practice, and he gave me like five of them. It's like really kind of awesome. uh, But he was always trying other things out on me. And uh, one time he said, uh, "Just look at look at what's in front of you. And that just make that your practice." So I said, "Okay." So I tried. You know, I was doing that. And, and I went back to talk to him. He said, what's your practice? And I said, uh, looking at what's in front of me. And he said, well, what do you see? So I started describing everything that was going on in my mind. And he said, no, no, no. That's not what I, I mean. Look at what's in front of you. What do you see? And I was like, I see you. And he said, all right. <laughs> and I realized how much I, I think, thought about meditation as my mind. And I started kind of, uh, recognizing how much I was in my head and I, I try to see what was in front of me. Um, and and then, of course, then I was very bored with what was in front of me because it was a shoji screen, and shoji screens are like just brilliant and people buy it, but that's a whole other story. Um, so uh, this practice of, of letting go uh, Dogen Zenji calls it Ji Ju Yu Zanmai. Zanmai is a transliteration of the word san, Samadhi. And Ji is the self, and Ju. Ju means, uh, well, the original character uh, 
was a character that actually meant giving and receiving because some of you heard me talk about this. That the character, original character in China, China had a, a little boat on the top and or a hand on the top uh, reaching down and a hand on the bottom reaching up and there was a boat in between. So it was considered the vehicle of giving and receiving. So that's the Jew of Jiu-Jiu-Yu. So it's a giving and receiving. And you is um, function. But when Jew you um, is the characters are put together, it means it, it has the uh, feeling and it's the idea of joy. So it's the joy. Um, and I, I always think of this giving and receiving as uh, an expression of, of interdependence, as an expression of what our life is. It's we're always inter interacting with uh, all of life in some way, not just what we can see, but what we can't see. And um, and so uh, it's a joy of uh, that uh, really immersing ourselves or being within the experience of giving and receiving um, is how he describes um, Zazen. And he also describes us in this word uh, yuge. And yuge uh, means, uh, yu means to um, play freely. And ge means to be transformed through play. And so yuge means transformation through free play. So, you know, that's that kind of describes what Chantaza is. There's nothing. To grasp when Dogen Zenji says, you know, just experience life as it is. You know, if you try to do something and you're trying to get something outside of yourself by, by just turning the light inwardly to illuminate the self, by studying the self, we illuminate that whole experience of interdependence that we are within. So it's not an intellect actual idea, it's an actual experience, because that's what life is. So we're all, I think we're always trying to find that connection and, and we look for it in relationships, but um, we have to continue to see, just like uh, we have to make our relationships on spiritual practice, because if we if we start to um, solidify um, or attach to a certain way of being, then it doesn't work anymore. And we have to constantly be, as Thich Nhat Hanh uses the word fresh, everything we do to be fresh. So I like this idea of when we are, are born, we are nirvanaized. <laughs> I was thinking about it in terms of, um, you know, the bardos uh, that I talked about in Tibetan Buddhism, because I'm very interested in the bardos. And um, of course, you know, there's the bardo of life, birth to death, and there's the bardo of the dying process that happens prior to and after death. And then there's that luminous bardo of um, our life kind of coming before us, you know, our consciousness dissipating and within that, you know, seeing everything. It's, it's, I think it's the same experience we have in Zazen, the way it's described. And so we, we sit and we, you know, it's, we used to, Minnesota Zazen, we used to call it watching your own movie, um, because, you know, all your stuff comes up. And, um, <clears throat> and so when we die, uh, those things, all those delusions that we haven't completely dealt with, all of those fears and things like that, show themselves and presumably you know, if we're prepared then in that third bardo we are we are polarized by the fear of it we we recognize it as our own creation our own delusion and and recognize that the fear has no substantiality and then uh, and however presumably however we um we do you know how we would harmonize with that luminous um, bardo. Uh, that next bardo is the bardo of becoming. And 
puts us into, I say, an energy field that um, is kind of um, of our own creation, of our own conscious creation. So if we get put into a harmonious um, Buddha field, or uh, I say Buddha, we are, if we are in a harmonious uh, energy field when we die, uh, chances are that however we are recycled into it will be a uh, harmonious uh, field. You know, and you know, Kishi Steve talks about creating a Buddha field. That's what we're doing with our practice. And if we, uh, our energy field is not harmonious, then we kind of take that with us into our next experience of uh, life, whether it's the human or the human. So I was thinking, and you know, so what if we were, we come into human life in an unharmonious energy field? Um, are we still neuroticized? <laughs> um, and, and what I was thinking about this morning or last night, um, is that um, when we come into human life, we really don't, you know, we are accumulation of energy and, and it's solidified in some way, and we call that human life. But actually, you know, it's always changing, even throughout our life, we're sharing cells, eating the cells, and we're breathing new air and, and eating different food, and our bodies grow and we change, and lots of things are happening to us. And Peggy kind of Roshi used to say, from the time we're born, we're marching towards death. So, in other words, we're always. You know, we're always uh, kind of dying in some way. Um, but I was thinking, the way that we come together as humans, we really, and we're constantly seeking for understanding what, what it is, what, what kind of energy brought this together. And and so that seeking mind, you know, and bodhicitta means, means aware, awakened, Mind, chitta means mind, and body means awakening. And a body, a body chitta is frequently uh, called the way seeking mind. And I was thinking a lot about body chitta a couple of years ago, and I, I was thinking, well, well, how can body chitta be both the way seeking mind, the thing that causes us to come to practice, causes us to, to look for a spiritual practice, and also the thing that we constantly have to keep up awakening to uh, within practice, what is the relationship? And I thought, oh yeah, what brings us to these practices is that my life isn't working. And and we let go of all our ideas about how it could have been working or was working. Um, something in our life is working and then it it you know kind of throws us into into the spirit a spiritual uh, search. But within this, within the practice itself, that's constant search. So, you know, um, we have to keep looking at our delusion. And the value of looking at our delusion is we learn how to recognize when we're doing what, what we do that causes us. What, what we do, I we learn to recognize um, the things that we what, that we're doing that are kidding ourselves. I don't know how does that and my children say I read it at the phone one say I'm used to say um, that we, we recognize um, somehow we can't, we can't kid ourselves anymore about um, and to learn to recognize that according to you know Tibetans what they talk about that you know, Zen Buddhists, such as Zen Buddhists, don't talk about that. They just say, you know, I already go to one, you know, at least I can. But Tibetans study all that, and they write about it, and they talk about it. And it's, it's a very interesting the way they talk about it, you know. But um, they say that, that one of the best ways to prepare for this is through meditation. And, uh, uh, you know, and I can see that because. When you know, I, I started to recognize the things, the stories I tell myself and how I'm creating my own attachments and mindsets of reality. 
And of course, you know, <laughs> and, and I, you know, for the longest time, I used to ask, why are the senses, you know, put down so much in Buddhist stuff? <laughs> and and uh, finally, I, I started to realize that the sen our senses, uh, including our mind, Buddhism, mind is a sense, um, we, and if we, um, our senses are the reason that we attach to things because our senses, through our senses, we give things a sense of reality. And because we live in impermanence, a constantly changing reality, we feel unstable. So we always want something to hold on to. We see something and that becomes our reality. Or we hear something that becomes our reality. Or we think something. We think we get things figured out. We start doing this from a very young age. We start to kind of put things in order so that we can be functioning in life in our mind, and then we start to think, that's the way life is, that's the way to be. And we start stop exploring, we stop seeking, and then that becomes a problem. So this attachment, you know, when we're, when we're babies, we really come into life not near our sized. You know, we really come with questions and always come kind of exploring. Um, but then, you know, in order to function in life, we have to figure out how to do that. And uh, even that, even the way we function in life can all, is always um, subject to some kind of tweaking, some kind of change. So I think that's all I have to say. Does anybody want to uh, say anything? I, I wanted to um, say two things. One is to share the picture that you were referring to of the hands giving and receiving and the vehicle in between, um, because it's just perfect. <laughs> so. Thank you. The other thing though, that I, that struck me just now when you were talking about how human beings start out life and then how they kind of get derailed from that spontaneous kind of energy that they come in with. And, and it, it, it's like, I can, you know, how many times have I heard a parent say, well, by now you should be... It's, it's a lot of it is just plain old expectations coming home on, on the head of this, this little kid who, when they're six months old, it's fine for them to, you know, fuss every time they're feeling uncomfortable and so on and so on. And when they're older, it's, it's not acceptable. So I, it's, it's a huge trap that they, they walk into as as little kids to try to live in the world and be acceptable you know it, yeah it's... i mean i think that you know I, but that, that's all part of dukkha so uh -huh. you know it's, it's like if you look at very traditional religions they'll say they say uh well if that doesn't work then you know ignore it <laughs> you know and i i think that um and so there's this good and bad that's very defined, but it doesn't really speak to the reality of what life is, which is that it's changing and that sometimes something that we do is good, but sometimes that same thing is not, not so good. It doesn't create harmony. And, and so that's a, a form of attachment. And I think that culturally, um, we we have cultural dukkha, <laughs> I think, that grasping and trying, always trying to find something that um, 
gives us a sense that we're not going to die. That sense of a sense of permanence, a sense of um, not feeling that uneasiness of not knowing what's next. Uh, I was writing something about this that I but don't know. Um, you know, there's a um, Korean teacher. I know him by Sansani, who I never met him, but he he wrote a book. I mean, or his students put a book together about his his. He always said, um, "Only don't know." And you know, he used to encourage, "Don't know mine." And I, and I was thinking about. Um, So this is what I wrote. I don't know if it makes any sense, but we come into life with within a collection of energy and become a temporarily solidified entity. But that collect, collection of temporary, temporary solidified energy has a consciousness that does not understand itself and seeks for understanding of self. The seen and unseen energy field we are within influences this understanding. Original mind is don't know, and awakened mind is don't know. So I don't know if that makes any sense, but. That's I, wonderful, yeah. I think that don't know mind is 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 the beginner's mind, you know. Yeah, oh, that's grand. And, and so this hunger or absolute need for connection to survive, um, gets translated into Sangha as a way of understanding that in a really positive way. And then there are a whole lot of others that, that aren't that, that have their pluses and minuses. And yeah, thank you. That's great. Dogen Zenji says that when we truly awaken to impermanence and interdependence, we can't break the precepts. <laughs> That's one that's been abused a lot. <laughs> yeah. So we just have to make a commitment not to abuse it. Right. But Zazen, you know, I mean, and it all goes back to Zazen <laughs> to me. Somebody came to the Zen Center of Asheville one time when I was living there. And she said, um, will you teach me how to meditate? And he's like, sure, I can tell her how to meditate. So she said, you know, I'm gonna she said, How much should I meditate? And I was like, Well, this is when we meditate and tell them as much as you can. And then she called me a couple weeks later and she said, um, well, she said, I really want to meditate. She hadn't come at all. She said, I really want to meditate. And I really believe that it will help me, but I actually I just don't have time. Can you do you know a quicker way? And I was like, well, if I did, I, I would be doing it. Because, <laughs> you know, it's not always so much fun to sit and look at this. <laughs> but there's really something um, beyond the angst. Um, I, I, so I've come to realize that the times when I have the most difficulty with sitting, uh, especially when my mind is just going crazy are the times that are the most beneficial to me. That's when I learn the most about myself. So, um, so, you know, getting one step beyond that resistance is letting go. And um, I still experience it with Zazen. <laughs> Although my mind overrides it and said, yeah, but <laughs> remember the results, Tejan. Uh, just in response to don't know mind um, and then connecting that to karma you know, and I and I've always heard that Buddha doesn't Buddha's teachings do not answer why questions but I do go to the pain of the world and the suffering and 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 I can't logically think that every single child in Gaza did all this myriad of horrific things to end up at the same place at the same time, I guess it's just, so my response is all I can do is kind of try to see myself and work on how my response to the world. Um, but then in a way, I feel like I'm turning 
a blind eye when I don't try to process the why questions. Um, so it's just a struggle I have. Does that make sense? I mean, if you do exhaust then you can't help but um, struggle with those questions, I think. You know, uh, and I, I think, you know, people like kind of Hiroshi and Tadahan and some of these people are, are, are really clear examples of, um, of having a very strong influence just through their practice uh, that goes beyond getting out and, I mean, Tadahan did I mean, we'll go, go out and do things and speak against injustice and things, but uh, he, he also recognized when I first met him, I was at Tulsa Har in 1983, and he said um, uh, that he, he created Plum Village as a place for uh, people who were um, protesting against the war to come for some um, kind of relief from, you know, I mean, anybody who's been involved in protests or speaking up against things, and that's, you know, it can be very kind of burnout. Mm -hmm. And so um, he is, and also some perspective. And he himself would only leave the monastery three months out of the year. And then eventually he, he traveled less and less as he got older, but um, I think, uh, he really valued, he really put a value on the uh, practice as a way of really getting clarity about how to help. And, and in the book, Mindful Politics, all of them, you know, there's, there's writings by him, by Kapir Roshi, and various teachers about how to help others, how to really help in the world. And I think it's it's very easy to get really caught up in movements and things like that. You know, I did when I was younger and and lose sight of you know how how to really bring about change and you just create a, a lot of polar, polarization between people, which is what's happening in our culture right now. And and how how can we learn how to, you know, Tigna Han when he was at Tel Sahara, somebody had Asking the question, um, how do we bring about, how can we bring about peace? And this is, it completely goes directly to what you were saying. Uh, he said, first, we, we have to become peace. I, I guess I'm trying to conceptualize it too, of, because one of the first, you know, chants we learn is all my ancient twisted karma and you know, born of greed, hate, and delusion, and mm. and we think of countless lifetimes. But I guess it, and I hear what you're saying. Like if I stay with within what I can do, you know, there are things I can do here. But it, I still jump to the sadness. I still jump to why is this happening to this person? Oh. Why, you know, I can't think that they have so much. Horrific. I mean, I can't think that it's, and I know this has been talked about a million times, but I guess I'm just struggling with it lately. Um, you know, that a child has to endure all of this. Um, I can't conceptualize that this child is dealing with this because of all their ancient twisted karma. Is that, do you know what I'm saying? Like it's, I don't really have a place to put that. I can, I can look at myself, look at what, what can I do? How can I help the situation? How can I, you know, I feel okay about that. I'm just, maybe I'm intellectualizing it and that's what I need to let go of. I don't know. I mean, one of the things about letting go is that we can't make it happen. And a lot of times it's because we don't, well, I think all the time it's because we really don't realize what it is that we got to let go of. <clears throat> you know, we may have some idea of what we need to let go of, but there's often some underlying thing that, because as long as it's in our heads, it doesn't work. I guess I should ask, I guess it, what, I guess I should ask what, how do you work on your own world pain? You're asking me? Mm -hmm. Yeah. My own personal pain? Um, not your personal pain, but pain about the world. There's a good German word for it. I forgot what it is, but 
Well, I think we're all suffering from the same thing in life, yeah. you know, ultimately. And I don't think that having particularly gives us any great advantage. We in the United States think that, think that because we have things. But, you know, the great teachers, Thich Nhat Hanh, Karagiri Roshi, they came out of war-torn war countries. You know, Karagiri Roshi talked about being at AAG, and he said the morning porridge was water with a few grains of rice floating in it. I mean, they were starving in Japan. And uh, he, you know, he fixed engines for kamikaze pilots, or he checked engines before they went out. And I asked him, and he said he cried every time. I mean, and the depth of his practice was something that I just cannot even touch. But being around him inspired all of us so much to, to, to do this practice. And I think, I, I, I gotta say, you know, I look at these things and I think, oh, these, these poor children. But I look at our country and I, and I see some, such unnecessary, useless, you know, confusion and uh, you know sometimes I wonder if, if it's really helping us so much to to have so much and to you know we don't we don't have we you can't have compassion if you don't you know if you don't suffer. That's true. How can you have compassion for people who suffer? Yeah that's a good point. I would love if you taught a class on the Bardos. Oh I, I am not qualified but uh Han Lai, um, uh, who's in town, he did a, a series on it uh, last year about this time. And uh, I think it's on tape. You might be able to get it through Urban Dharma. Okay. Uh, Christine, did you have something to say? Uh, yes, for me, um, uh, along this whole issue of the world and how much pain and suffering there is, um, also <laughs> realizing that uh we have no control like i like i have i just have to give it give it up just give up control that's what i'm working on and um not knowing not knowing and that's been my path lately i'd love to add is there space to add um, you gotta speak a little louder. I would love to add to this thread of <clears throat> world pain and sitting with world pain. I studied an indigenous author named Robin Zimmer, and um, she has experienced a lot of abuse and pain with her and her people from um, the white patriarchy and. She talks about uh, grief and alchemizing grief, metabolizing grief through action. Um, we've been talking about action, how there is a buildup of the pain and the abuse in our bodies. And through creation, we can move that through and uh, bridge that gap that's between us and peace. We are the bridge in ourselves. Um, and I've always found that very helpful through my movement within this world that I am the change, the people are the change. And I don't know really what's going on, but I do know there is harm and to bring Peace, I am that peace. Mm -hmm. Now, I think <clears throat> you talked about creation. I think it create creating things, true creativity comes from letting go. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> yeah. I just want to make an observation, but I'm hearing from what you said earlier and from what you've been saying about Thich Nhat Hanh and Katagiri Roshi and and this woman who just spoke is is uh, sounds like it's creating a Buddha field. These uh -huh. people 
That's what that's what I'm catching at. That's the thread I'm getting through the conversation. Yeah, kind of hear Roshi used to say our zazen gets into the walls. And when I was at Zen Center of Asheville, you know, we were just in a little house. We used the living room for a meditation at hall. And we didn't put up a sign. We just, people that found out about it just came. And, but all the neighbors knew what we were doing. When I met the neighbors, they were, they were like, oh, I think you live at that Zen place. And I'm like, yeah, and then and my neighbor next door, they were Baptists, and they, this lady, someone, her niece died, and she wanted to ask, she would ask me about communicating with spirits, which, you know, Zen is not about that, but um, just they, they, and there was a born-again Christian behind us, and he was, you know, we all, they all kind of were aware of what we were doing, and I felt like <clears throat> our Zazen went beyond the walls, you know, kind of. Uh, and, and it wasn't like, oh, you, you guys are Buddhists and we don't accept Buddhists. It was just like, oh, yeah, well, we're all neighbors. And, and the same thing happened here. You know, our neighbor over here is the daughter of a Baptist minister. And she's, she's a very nice person, but you don't call her on Sunday. You don't even text her on Sunday, you know, because Sunday is completely church, you know. And... <clears throat> So, you know, and there's uh, our neighbors all around. Uh, you know, there's a little kind of a uh, um, shrine, another shrine. What do you call it? Um, it looks like a little outside church on the other side of the, um, the oh, where the horses are on the other side of that um, ridge over there, you know, on the other side of Chris's place. Um, you know, so I feel like this is a holy hill. <laughs> you know, like we're all kind of on this spiritual quest and all kind of helping each other. But I do think that it, uh, I think that this, this Sangha, the, the, it's coming together like this, it's, it's, it creates a blue field and who knows, you know, cyberspace, yeah, it, it might just really extend it. You know, we, we poo poo uh, online, Zoom and all that stuff, but hey, it kept us connected through quarantine. <laughs> it made me really, and of course the air was a lot clearer then. <laughs> But not some airplanes Yeah, I would like to say that um, just being on Zoom, and I love it when I can see the people there who are there with you in the in the space, and I I can feel that Buddha feel just. Can you see it? But you can see it, see everybody. You can't see everybody though today. Oh, no, but but you can at other times. There you go. You know, not you. during the lecture, but you know, as you begin and the zazen begins, yeah. it's like you can feel the Buddha field. And yeah. you know, yeah. I thank you for sort of acknowledging that we seek nirvana because we know that we are all connected. And so then we have these glorious moments when we can actually feel it. Yeah. I'm yeah, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, and my students at Warren Wilson used to say to me when I talk about um, that experience, you know, uh, they called it being in the flow. <laughs> and they said, yeah, but, you know, we can get into the flow without doing zazen, without doing meditation. And I said, yeah, but do you know how you got there? <laughs> you know, because my experience of getting in the flow before I started sitting was, yeah, I would, I mean, I would, I, things are kind of moving and I seem to be just, but uh, I, I, didn't, I didn't know how to get back there. <laughs> but Zazen somehow, it's just sitting down and shutting up. If you stay with it, it just kind of, you just kind of see those things that are obstacles and just seeing them is kind of removing them for even a second. So, yeah. Thank you all. I think we're about finished. I'm going to do, um, we'll do the closing chat and then uh, and giving back the merit and then I'll do three vows and we'll have the uh, exit pass. <clears throat> May the merit of this practice May the merit of this practice benefit all beings, benefit all beings, 
And bring peace. And bring peace. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the language is awesome. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Speak the speakers off on the phone. Oh, buddy. 